Dear elders, you may already know that I am legally required to send my sons to school because we live in Germany and home education is not permitted here. In this country, all children are taught a curriculum designed with only white children in mind. A quick flick through most standard school atlases will reveal stereotypical images of Africans. Many science books still teach that there is such a thing as a mention rasa, or biological human race. Those rare examples of German texts which do portray black people will often use degrading imagery and vocabulary to describe us, as if the sheer absence of images of healthy, happy black children, adults, and families was not enough. Every day I send my children to school knowing that if a white teacher uses a racist word in their lesson, my sons will be on their own. If my children speak up, more times than not, the teacher will label them sensitive or stubborn. The teacher will almost always call upon their impressive collection of black friends as proof that they cannot possibly be accused of such a terrible crime. They don't see colour. They are the least racist person. And I think that place at the end of the queue where the least racist people stand, it must be pretty damn crowded down there. Colleagues will always give the teacher their full support while the white classmates watch and learn the most important lessons of all, how to ignore and belittle black children's concerns. I have tried, like the time when one of my son's classmates put an eraser to my son's skin in an attempt to rub the hue off, while at the same time another classmate told him, black is the color of the devil. That time, I visited the school with a white mother and talked calmly about stereotypes and suggested some children's stories with positive images of black people. I worked with the school diversity committee to bring the black German exhibition Home Story Deutschland to Berlin. It stood on the school premises for five weeks. I have written letters. I have attended school conferences. I have taken advice from an anti-discrimination office. I have emailed my written protest to like-minded community members and encouraged them to also write to the school. I have been silent. So far, none of these strategies have worked. Still, I cannot give up. There are other black children at their school as well as in schools across Germany. They may be even more isolated than my sons. All over the country, children find their own strategies to resist the sometimes subtle, sometimes overt, but always violent combination of racism and adultism that they experience. Our children are stronger than we realize. They survive their own experiences of discrimination. They describe being labeled as aggressors when they stand up for themselves. They survive the experience of seeing their parents suffer and fail to protect them. And still, every morning at 8 a.m., they are expected to be in the institution and perform. This is what our society expects them to do. It takes a village to raise a child is not an empty motto of ours. Please do not leave the raising of our children in the hands of the German school system alone. Please support families and communities to teach our black children about our African diaspora, our history, our peoples, our economies, our struggles, our achievements. Let us use our own educational materials, those which feature black people, historical figures, contemporary personalities, as well as fictional characters. Let us support our black children to be proud of themselves. Let them know that we have their backs. Wherever negative images of black people are being presented, we have a duty to continue to raise our voices. We must not leave the mainstream in the hands of the mainstream. Although we as adults can, for the most part, choose to spend our time in safe and empowering spaces if we want to, our children are forced to survive 
in white educational institutions. As a member of the Initiative of Black People in Germany, I have learned that activism does not only mean fighting for something or fighting against something, but it does also involve fighting alongside those who are already fighting for themselves. Dear elders, let us support our children's resistance. Your sincerely, Sharon Dudua Otu. Dear children, when I wrote a letter to the village back in spring 2013, I posted it on my personal blog, and I guess you could say it went viral. It was on Facebook, Twitter, and it was even published in the African Courier, a bi-monthly international magazine reporting on Africa and its diaspora. I wrote it because I was frustrated at the state of affairs in the German education system. I am a mother of four, Three of my children were in school at the time, and even though the 2001 Program for International Student Assessment, or the PISA Studia, basically concluded that the German education system sucked if you were not a white child, I could not make out any tangible effort that had been taken to redress the imbalance since. Just before I published the letter, I had been involved in the so-called children's book debate, and expressed the opinion that racist words had no place in children's literature, or in any literature for that matter. My point was not that we should simply ban the books or remove offending words and leave the rest of the often equally problematic plot intact. My wish was that we would engage in an honest debate about what kind of society we would want to raise all of our children in. Racist books are toxic for black children, and other children of colour, and they do a disservice to white children too. And yes, I admit, I was hoping that we might get along, get, a more, um, get more diverse German language children's books along the way. I was angry that many of my fellow activists were ridiculed and insulted, even in articles published in major German newspapers. I was hurt that other peers decided not to engage in the debate at all and criticised me for doing so. I wrote the letter to say, we cannot wait until the education system recognizes its own failings. Just because we survived it, this does not mean that we should expect our children to do the same. They deserve better. Four years later, I am now writing an open letter to you. Instead of publishing it on my blog or on Facebook, I'm reading it here at this conference entitled Schools of Tomorrow, a wonderful conference with a diverse range of adults sitting in, the back, <laughs> sitting in the audience. Many of them work in the German education system, and I think there is some kind of sweet justice in them being forced to sit and listen to my words as well as clap for me at the end. <laughs> Don't you think? I'm doing this for you, dear children. It's a sacrifice, but you're worth it. I begin with a poem called No Problem, by Dr. Benjamin Zephaniah, a writer and poet who was born and raised in England, in Birmingham to be specific, and is of Jamaican roots. Zephaniah writes and reads out his poems in a very distinct way, which I cannot do full justice to. But I chose to read this poem to you anyway because although he was born in 1958, Zephaniah describes experiences, feelings, and opinions which many of you probably recognize only too well. No problem. I am not the problem, but I bear the brunt of silly playground taunts and racist stunts. I am not the problem, I am a born academic, but they got me on the run, and then they call me athletic. I am not the problem, if you give I a chance, I can teach you of Timbuktu. I can do more than dance. I am not the problem. I greet you with a smile. You put me in a pigeonhole. But I am versatile. These conditions may affect me as I get older. And I am positively sure 
I have no chips on me shoulder. Black is not the problem. Mother country, get it right. And just for the record, some of me best friends are white. <coughs> Dear children, you may be wondering, if things were so awful while we adults were in school, why have we not done anything to change it? Why is it all still so bad? And I have to be honest, I've often wondered the exact same thing. According to statistics published in an Open Society, Society Justice Initiative report in 2013, 50% of white German pupils in Berlin take the secondary school leaving certificate known as the Abitur, 50%. By comparison, less than a third of children from families where German is not the main language sit the Abitur. Moreover, just 6.1% of teachers in Germany have a so-called migration background, whereas 20% of the children in Germany and almost 25% of school pupils in Berlin are not white Germans. Finally, a German Hauptschule is a place where children are excluded from sitting the secondary school leaving certificate, the Abitur. Children with a so-called migration background are twice as likely to end up in a Hauptschule than their white German counterparts. This holds even when we take class into account. How can it be that these things still happen in the 21st century? But you know, rather than go down that desperate pit of no return, I suggest that we take the focus off the bad stuff. I know that you see enough of that already. Instead, I would like to bring you news from that proverbial village, the individuals I know and admire who take the saying seriously. I would like to tell you what has happened since I first wrote that letter some four years ago. As usual, when I write something, I send it to my close friends for feedback. And back then in 2013, my good friend Miriam wrote a response which contained the sentence, Sharon, we need our own school, I'm telling you. We have about four years to get seriously organized before our children start school. We had both forgotten about that email until I came across it while I was writing this letter to you. At the time Miriam wrote it, my youngest son was just one, and Miriam was pregnant with her daughter. Today, they both attend Sankofa Kita, a beautiful childcare facility initiated and run by Miriam. After all that she and her older two children had experienced at the hands of German pedagogues, regrettably even those fighting to occupy that coveted space at the end of that queue, she decided to found her own educational institution, and I am bursting with pride for her achievement. That's my friend. Sankofa is a space for black children designed with their experiences, cultures, knowledge, and realities in mind. There are three groups and three languages spoken in Akita, French, German, and English. Other African diaspora languages are also celebrated through song and nursery rhymes, and apart from the standard offer of indoor and outdoor play, arts and crafts, baking, gardening, music, the children of Sankofa are given the gift of seeing adults who look like them, as well as other children who look like them, in a positive, supporting, caring, and happy environment. This is invaluable for the children's self-esteem and emotional growth. And when Miriam says black lives matter, you know she means it. She's on the bed. <laughs> Another example is our anti-discrimination representative for schools. Is Soraya here? I don't see her, okay. Soraya Gomez recently took up this part-time position in the education department of the Berlin Senate. To be honest, there are not enough hours in the day to sing Soraya's praises. Not only is she a secondary school teacher who fiercely loves her pupils, she's also a board member of Each One Teach One, a charitable organization based in Wedding, which runs various educational projects for black children and young people, including the Vera Haya Archive, a library filled with literature of the African diaspora, and a youth club called 
Black Youth Fridays. Last summer, Soraya also agreed to take a position within the local government administration. Her role there is to confront all forms of discrimination in Berlin schools. She works within the complaints management team in the Berlin Senate, as well as with head teachers and teaching teams across the city. As you can imagine, she is not bored. I am deeply grateful to Soraya for her endless energy, enthusiasm, and optimism. She is there for you. Finally, I would like to mention a special group of people who have been working in schools to raise awareness of police violence and institutional racism in Germany. Some of you may have heard of Uri Jallo, a man who burnt to death in a police cell in Dessau in 2005. Members of the Initiative in Remembrance of Uri Jallo and youth worker Sebastian Fleary are running theatre in education workshops in schools and youth clubs across Germany. The trailer I'm about to show is in German and contains footage of a workshop that was run last year. The key themes of the workshop are the promotion of activism, human rights, and diversity. They fight to ensure that Uri Jalo did not die in vain. They have my deepest respect. Es war der 7. Januar im Jahre 2005, an diesem Tag hatte ein Afrikaner keinen Haufen Glück. Aus Sierra Leone ist er aus dem Krieg geflohen, das gute Deutschland wurde sein neues Ziel zum Wohnen. Er hat in Dessau gelebt, morgens nach der Diskothek hatte er zwei Frauen auf der Straße gesehen. Wollte nur telefonieren, was anderes wollte er echt nicht. Doch die beiden Damen fühlten sich von ihm belästigt und deswegen haben sie die Polizei verständigt. Nachdem sie eintrafen, wurde die ganze Sache brenzlig. Er war betrunken, kam direkt von einer Party. Zwei Beamte kamen, ist doch klar, dass man Gefahr sieht. Handgreiflich wurden sie, natürlich hat er sich gewehrt. Und danach wurde er in den Streifenwagen reingezerrt, in das nächste Polizeirevier gebracht. Hör lieber gut zu, denn was danach passiert, ist krass. Zu diesem Thema gibt es nicht vieles zu sagen, außer Ich spreche das Schweigen und zeige euch nur die Fakten. Aufklärung und Gerechtigkeit Die Polizei will alles vertuschen Doch wir wissen das war Im Polizeirevier, da ging es richtig ab Sage mir doch bitte mal für was Denn er hat doch nichts gemacht Trotzdem wurde er in den Keller gebracht So als bestehe wirklich ein krimineller Verdacht In Zelle 5 kam er rein, wurde hingelegt Auf eine feuerfeste Matratze Schlimm zu sehen, doch merkt euch Die Matratze, auf die er lag, war feuerfest Aber gleich kommt es zu Skandal Seine beiden Hände und beide Füße wurden gefesselt Diese Monster haben haben dann bestimmt noch über ihn gelächelt Paar Stunden danach kam es zum Feueralarm Sie haben nicht mal nachgeschaut, sie haben gar nichts getan Den Feuermelder ausgemacht und draufgekackt Nach paar Minuten haben sie die Zelle aufgemacht Doch es war zu spät, denn keiner kam ihm zur Not Er wurde von den Flammen verschlungen, was für ein Tod Zu diesem Thema gibt es nicht vieles zu sagen, außer Ich spreche das Schweigen und zeige euch nur die Fakten Aufklärung und Gerechtigkeit, die Polizei will alles vertuschen, doch wir wissen. The workshops are supported by RAA Berlin. Your homework, due tomorrow, is to ask your teachers to contact the RAA and invite the team to your school. There are so many more people I could mention. For example, Dr. Andres Nader, who runs the RAA Berlin, which confronts institutional discrimination in the education system. Or Dr. Elina Mama, who researches images of Africa in German school books. Josefina Praku and Dr. Jule Bernkost, who run the Institute for Education Without Discrimination, which currently provides training for teachers on how to teach about colonialism and colonial racism. Meral L, who work closely with the Open Society Justice Initiative to organize the 2013 conference called Naming Discrimination in Berlin Schools from Racism to Inclusion. 
Professor Dr. Maisha Auma, a scholar specializing in childhood indifference. Nuran Yid and Mariam Hashemi Yekani, two of the many powerhouses behind the initiative to found Benedisk, the Berlin Network Against Discrimination in Schools and Kindergartens. There are many, many more individuals, groups, initiatives who I have not mentioned and who I will personally apologize to if you come and see me after the talk. I would also like to give an honorable mention to all those parents, carers, and volunteers who regularly read to children in class or help out at the school summer festivals or raise money to buy diverse books and toys for Berlin preschools. My point is, we are out there. We all have your backs. The changes that are needed in order to make schools better for you and your peers are structural and far more and more far-reaching than any one of us individuals can manage alone. Access to good quality education, which does not demean, belittle, or insult you, is a basic human right. Institutional and structural discrimination in the German education system is a serious issue, which must be addressed by senior management and politicians if all children in Germany, not just the privileged, are to access good quality education. However, we village members, we said to ourselves, if we wait for them to make the first move, we'll be waiting a long time. Each of us decided to start somewhere. And we soon, we will soon pass the baton to you, dear future village members. I look forward to working with you very much. There is more than enough to do. For example, Sankofa can always do with an extra pair of hands. The Berlin Senate needs to hear your suggestions about how schools can truly offer equality of opportunity. And please remember, your teachers need to be told about the school workshop offer. I'm going to end my letter to you with one more poem from Dr. Zafanaya, because it's so fitting. Please bear in mind that he wrote the poem long before any of us had ever heard of President Barack Obama. And, um, do click your fingers at the parts you connect with the most. The poem is called, I Have a Scheme. I am here today, my friends, to tell you that there is hope. As high as that mountain may seem, I must tell you, I have a dream. And my friends, there is a tunnel at the end of the light. And beyond that tunnel, I see a future. I see a time when angry white men will sit down with angry black women and will talk about the weather. <laughs> black employers will display notice boards proclaiming, me don't care where you come from, you know. So long as you can do a good day's work, that cool with me. I see a time when words like affirmative action will have sexual connotations. And black people all over this blessed country of ours will play golf. Yes, my friends, that time is coming. And in that time, Afro-Caribbean and Asian youth will spend big money on English takeaways. And all police officers will be armed with a dumpling. I see a time, a time when the President of the United States of America will stand up and say, I inhaled and it did kind of nice. So rewind and come again. Immigration officers will just check that you are all right and all black people will speak Welsh. I may not get there, my friends, but I have seen that time. I have seen thousands of muscular black men on Hampstead Heath walking their poodles and hundreds of black female Formula One drivers racing around Birmingham in pursuit of a truly British way of life. I have a dream that one day from all the churches of this land, we will hear the sound of that great old English spiritual. Here we go, here we go, here we go. One day all great songs will be made that way. I am here today, my friends, to tell you that the time is coming when all people, regardless of color or class, will have at least one Barry Manilow record and vending machines throughout the continent of Europe will flow with sour sap and sugarcane juice. For it is written in the great book of multiculturalism that the curry 
will blend with the shepherd's pie and the Afro hairstyle will return. Let me hear you say multiculture. Amen. Let me hear you say roti roti. A women. The time is coming. I may not get there with you, but I have seen that time. And as an equal opportunities poet, it pleases me to give you this opportunity to share my vision of hope. And I just hope that you can cope with a future as black as this. Yours sincerely, Sharon Dodwa Utu. Thank you.